contributions by other people. Um, let me just read the, the afterword is by Fray Beto, uh, one of the major voices for social justice in Latin America, a Dominican friar from Brazil. He was a political prisoner for four years during a military dictatorship in that country, and so on. His, just the first and last sentence of his afterword. The model of the progressive utilization theory, Prout, presented here is a crystalline way by Dada Maharshi Varananda, along with other complementary texts, joins many proposals and alternatives to help humanity overcome neoliberal capitalism. The final sentence, let us now take up the content of this work with daring and faith, because the future, the matter of our dream, will only become a reality today, in the present, if we plant the seed. On one personal note, I just met Donna today for the first time. But in 1970, uh, I had just returned to the, the town that I'd grown up in, Columbus, Ohio, to begin my study in philosophy for a PhD. That year, in Arlington, Upper Arlington High School, a suburb of Columbus, a young man had graduated. He, like me at the time, was an anti-war activist. He was more radical than I was. He burned his draft card. By that time, I didn't have to worry about the draft because I was already married and had a child. After five years, I went on to Loyola University, where you know, I've been ever since. This other guy had a lot longer journey. First, all over the United States, and then off to India, where he met P.R. Sakar, an activist, a spiritual activist who had been imprisoned since 1971 by Indira Gandhi. Uh, he met Sakar in prison, uh, and Sakar was the activist, the originator of this proud philosophy, he became a monk. Uh, he then spent, I think, 14 years in Southeast Asia, in India, a long time in the Philippines, Indonesia, then went off to Europe, spent three years there, then went to Brazil for 11 years, where, among other things, he became close to some of the major liberation theologians, Leonardo Bloch, for example, you know, and now he's in Venezuela, and now our paths cross, he's in Chicago, let me present Adam Andresh Badalanda. Yeah! Thank you very much. In Venezuela, I presented my book to the president, and he liked it, so he talked about it a little bit on his television show. He gets 15 books a week, so it's no big deal. But uh, the petroleum company was interested, so they wrote us and they, I and a professor from Australia went there to Venezuela at the end of 2003 to give training about alternative economics, this model, to experts in the cooperatives department, the um, uh, planning department, and the telecommunications department. At the end of these three-day training, we asked all these officials, you know, what did you think, you know? And they all said it was way beyond our expectations. But when we asked them, what was your greatest difficulty in the presentation? They, three of them said the greatest difficulty was listening about alternative economics from somebody dressed in bright orange and wearing a turban. That was the hardest thing for them to deal with. So I hope you guys can deal with this appearance, okay? This is what I'm going to talk about after capitalism. I was in Brazil during the first, second, and third, and the sixth, and the ninth, anyway, various world social forums, and always the theme is this, another world is possible. So, excuse me, you guys can ask me questions, but I would like to reserve the right to ask you people questions. Is that an okay contract, people? All right. So what kind of a world would you like? I would like to hear from people just one part, one word, or one sentence about their vision your vision, I'm sorry, for a better world. What kind of world would you like to see? Anyone? Peace, right? Equality. What? Cooperative. Cooperative, sure. What else? Equality. Equality, yes. No more war. 
war. No more war. Sure. Anti-capitalism, Anti right? End. 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 End of capitalism. End of capitalism. End of capitalism. Yes. End. End of capitalism. Sports for the people. Sports for the people. No rich people. Sure. What else? No poor people. Sure. Yes. Others? Justice. Sure. Social justice. Sure. Others? No jails. I like that. I like all these. Anyone else? Nobody hungry. What? Nobody hungry. No more hunger. Sure. Repair the earth. Repair the earth, of course. Protect our world, our planet. Yes. One moment. What? Run by women. More women. Come on. Run by women. Yes. I give talks around the world, and the answers are always the same. Okay. No poverty, war, hunger. Right environmental protection, human rights, but basically everybody wants a world of peace and justice. It's kind of basic. I think global capitalism is going to end because every human made system eventually does end. And it's based on profit, selfishness and greed. This is a movie. They just came out of the movie, right? The people on the left are really happy because it was a great movie. And the people on the right are really sad because the movie was called The Economy. It works really well for some people, right? It just doesn't work for everybody. Advertise. Look, honey, I bought something today. Oh, honey, I'm so proud of you. What did he buy? Totally doesn't matter, right? Anything. It can be a Coca-Cola, it can be a pair of shoes, it can be an auto part. But total happiness is promised if you buy this product. I don't know about you, but I think it's a lie. I have a laptop. I use it. I don't sleep with it at night. It's not the love of my life. Love comes, happiness comes from your heart, right? It's not things. But the advertising message is it's things. Buy the things and you'll be happy. I think it's a lie, okay? Most universities teach economics as some kind of pure science, like physics, you throw a ball up, it doesn't matter who throws it up, right? Anybody, it's pure science, right? And they also try to teach you that inequality doesn't matter because as long as the economy is growing, everybody benefits. I, I won't give words to express what I think about this opinion, but this is what's taught in many universities. I think there are four fatal flaws of global capitalism. I think you'll agree with most of these. Of course, great concentration of wealth. Most investments are in speculation instead of production. The debt, the increasing debt, and the tendency to, of course, exploit the environment. I have trouble with these statistics because they keep changing, so I have to keep updating this every few weeks, okay? At the moment, it's about $16 trillion debt, right, trillion, 1.4 trillion dollar budget deficit, 517 more imports and exports, right, the government has to borrow nearly four billion dollars every day, just including Saturdays, Sundays and holidays, right, just to pay the bills. And this last one bothers me the most, because this last one is about what they call consumer debt. No student loans here, no house loans, no car loans, because those are considered things that might grow in value economically, whatever. But this is just credit cards, payday loans, the really, really high interest stuff. And it averages $16,000 per family. That's horrible. And you know every family doesn't have it, which means the next family does, right? has more. So in Great Britain, they went and interviewed people who had debt. And they found that they hide it from their parents, from their friends, even from their partners. They hide the debt. And why do they hide it? Because they, it's, it's hurting their health. It hurts their job performance. It hurts their relationships. And they feel shame and guilt. This is an economic situation. This is not a crime. And yet people feel that way. 
Do any of you know people who are in debt? Do any of you know people who are suffering because of this debt? It's inhuman. So, what's the alternative? Okay, enough of this negative stuff. I lived in Philippines. His wife is from Philippines. And there's this funny word in Filipino, which is called bayanihan, which means literally to move a house together. And this first painting, can't see very well, but it's everybody in the community is moving a house when the water comes up. But the same word in Filipino, in, in Venezuela, of course, and it's not in any other Spanish-speaking country, only in Venezuela. Nobody knows where it comes from. Kayapa, which means to move together, to work together, to solidarity. You people are very progressive, so I think you know all this stuff, but I'm just going to very briefly, you know, more than one billion people, a sixth of our global population is presently a member of a cooperative, right? They provide, co-ops provide more than 100 million jobs, much more than all the multinational corporations put together, right? And they're more likely to succeed than privately owned businesses. In the United States, 60 to 80 percent of new companies fail in the first year. 60 to 80 percent. I don't hear this news on CNN. I don't know about you. <laughs> and in the first um, five years, only three to five percent of new corporations are still existing and 90 percent of cooperatives are still existing. Nearly 90 percent. These are statistics. And yet, I don't hear this on the economic news. Cooperatives are the base of a local economy, an economic democracy, because everybody benefits. Workers own their own enterprises, and it works. Venezuela, just briefly. The closest estimates from the Gestión Participativa is 66,000 functioning cooperatives today. Um, the second highest number in the world after China. The Prout Research Institute that I'm the director of, we made a documentary about cooperatives in Barlavento, Estado Miranda, two hours outside of Caracas. This is a zone that is mostly Afro-Venezuelans, right? Descendants of former slaves with a history of discrimination and racism, of, unfortunately, poverty. And we found that these are all, we studied 50 of them. We did surveys and we went back four years later and did another survey. These cooperatives are doing very well. And these are men, they're women who've never had jobs before, official jobs. There are men who have never worked for themselves before. And they're enterprises that are working and creating income for the people, empowering the people and the communities. Credit unions, you know, are a wonderful source of economic power for communities. They're more successful than commercial banks. They fail much less often than commercial banks do in this country. Again, I don't hear this on the business news um, because of these reasons. They really benefit everybody and all the profits aren't sucked away for speculation or to line people's pockets. So, second question for you guys. Why don't people cooperate more of the time? What are some reasons? Fear. Fear? The government makes it difficult. The government makes it difficult. Lack of tradition of cooperation. Lack of tradition. Greed. Greed. The economy is based on competition. Economy is based on competition. You can get richer maybe if you're in a private enterprise than in a cooperative. Any other reasons? Very what? To be very individualistic. Uh, individualistic. A culture of individualism maybe? Yeah. Okay. What about our educational system? That's very cooperative, right? Team teaching all the time? I mean, when I was in school... Yeah, they don't teach it in economics classes. They don't teach it. No, they don't teach it in economics classes, no. And in school, right? 
You're, you can get an A, and the student beside you can be failing. And it's no reflection on you, right? <laughs> I get my grade, he gets his grade, right? Why aren't we learning together? The teachers say that actually, educational experts say that students usually learn better in, in small groups. Competitive. competitive, they make it that way. Yeah. So this is a funny cartoon. And it comes from various, also scientific, you know. When I was in school, there was a book out called On Aggression by Conrad Lorenz about anthropology, you know, saying that basically every tribe is, is competitive and, and dangerous, right? Aggressive. And then a, a decade later, Richard Dawkins, a biologist, very famous biologist from the UK, he makes this book called The Selfish Gene, that basically we're all selfish by nature. Um, well, I think we are selfish by nature, but we're also cooperative by nature. And it kind of depends on what you're cultivating in your character. So I ask people in Venezuela what this represents. And they say the novellas, the soap operas, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody stabs each other. And then I ask people in this country, what do you think this represents here? Reality, Reality shows. Sure. Can everybody win in a reality show? No. You gotta, you gotta.